Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a really, uh, as, as you said, it's, uh, this area of splicing is, is a new area for us. We, we got into it through an interest in gene regulation, and so it's a privilege to be here at this place that's you know, made so many of the really important discoveries in splicing and alternative splicing. We work on a group of different parasites, uh, mainly human parasites, but also some parasites that are important to uh, either farm animals or to companion animals. The, the organism that, that we work most on is this organism here in yellow, which is Plasmodium falciparum. And this is a parasite, which is a eukaryotic parasite. And so, of course, the gene regulation in eukaryotic microbes is much more sophisticated than the gene regulation in, in bacteria or, or viruses. This image here shows a bunch of parasites that are inside a human red blood cell. And it's this form here that causes the pathology that's associated with the disease malaria. So as this parasite here grows, it's going to eat the red blood cell from within. And then as this one here is done, it explodes the red blood cell and goes off and finds other red blood cells nearby to invade. And in the case of Plasmodium falciparum, that process takes 48 hours, almost exactly 48 hours. So every two days, as your red blood cells explode, you get this peak of fever. So people are probably familiar with this concept in malaria that every two days, at least for this species, you get a peak of fever that then goes away again, and then two days later, the fever comes back even worse. And for most of us, if we contract this disease as adults and we don't treat it, then it will, it will kill us almost for sure. So in order to stop that, we need drugs against it or, in theory, a vaccine, although there, there is no vaccine to treat malaria that, that's effective. The work I'm going to talk today about is work that's done by my group at the University of Melbourne in collaboration with some other scientists who I'll mention and most of the work's done by a very talented PhD student, Lee Yo, who's coming to the end of his PhD. Okay, so this is, I guess, a, a slide that's not uh, needed for most of you to introduce this concept that, you know, in, in ancient days we had a concept of one gene leading to one protein, but more recently we understand that alternative splicing, as well as other mechanisms, can give rise to multiple proteins coming out of a single gene. So this increases the diversity of the proteome that any organism can, can generate given its genome. And one of the ways that it does that is through alternative splicing. This is a, a sort of schematic of what an apicomplexin parasite looks like, a plasmodium parasite, for example. And what we're interested in is changes in mRNA processing that give rise to alternative splice events. In this case here, we're showing different usage of two different exons, but of course, as most of you are aware, this could also involve moving of splice sites, skipping of individual exons, or skipping of individual introns, or combinations of those events. And that can give rise, of course, to changes in the protein sequence, but it can also give rise to the introduction of premature stop codons, and that will have an impact on the turnover, the stability, and potentially the destruction of messenger RNAs. So we think that one of the reasons that malaria parasites do this is not just to create a, a more diverse proteome, but also to allow a mechanism that would give rise to a, a fast potential for, for, for gene transcription changes. So, as most of you know already, alternative splicing is very widespread in metazoans. In, in humans, many people have done genome-wide surveys, and it looks like more than 90% of human genes are subject to alternative splicing. But it's not really known how widespread this phenomenon is in apicomplexin parasites. So I'm going to talk to you about two different parasites that my group works on. One of them is parasites from the genus Plasmodium that give rise to malaria, and malaria can infect humans, and we also use malaria parasites from a different species, Plasmodium bergii, that can infect rodents. And so this offers a nice test system where we can actually allow animals to be infected, whereas in the case of Plasmodium falciparum, human infections are difficult and, and often unethical to study. 
And I'm also going to talk about another parasite, Toxoplasma gondii, that probably half of us in this room are infected with at the moment, normally gives rise to chronic uh, long-term infections without symptoms, but in some circumstances, for example, in immunocompromised people or in pregnant women who become infected for the first time during their pregnancy can give rise to, to fetal abnormalities. These parasites are unicellular. So when we think about human splicing, this figure I talk about of 90% of genes being alternatively spliced, much of that data comes from comparing different tissues or comparing cells at different stages in humans, fetal compared to adult cells. In the case of plasmodium, we don't have multiple cells. There aren't different tissue types. But we do have different life stages. So these parasites actually have quite complex life stages. In the case of plasmodium, that goes from these where are we here? These blood cell stages here to sexual forms called gametocytes, which are passed to the mosquito, a variety of different life stages, diploid and haploid in the mosquito, back to the vertebrate host, infecting cells in the liver, and then breaking out to form cells in the human again, in the, in the erythrocytic stage. And these cells have different functions and are very different morphologically and molecularly. So there's great need for different genes to be expressed at different times, and we are interested in whether alternative splicing gives rise to some of the differences in gene regulation between these stages. The same is true of Toxoplasma gondii, in this case a very different life cycle that doesn't include the bite of a mosquito, but uh, a life cycle that has sex, for example, in the cat, and then can lead to dead-end infections in humans or infections in other animals that, that cats can predate on and go back into the cat. So again, we've got different life cell stages within these uh, vectors or within these different hosts here that require changes in gene expression from, say, fast-growing to slow-growing forms, from small forms to large forms, from forms that have to interact with a human immune system to cells that have to interact with a mosquito's midgut, for example. Within these two parasites, we also have quite different genome architecture compared to the mammalian uh, genomes you'll probably be more familiar with. In the case of both of these parasites, they have rather compact genomes. So their, their genomes are many times smaller than mammalian genomes, and the intergenic regions are, are much smaller. The intergenic and intragenic regions are smaller. So in this case here, I, I've drawn a, a kind of schematic of what a plasmodium genome looks like. Often the, the spaces between genes are the same size or smaller than the coding sequences themselves, and introns are traditionally much smaller than the exons. So this would be a traditional gene here where you might have an exon that's, say, 1,000 base pairs long, and then maybe an intron of 200 to 250 base pairs, and then another exon of, say, 500 nucleotides long. So this is quite traditional for this genome. Toxoplasma gondii has many more introns than plasmodium, but it still has this phenomenon of coding sequence existing in about the same proportion of the genome as, as non-coding sequence. This makes some bioinformatic tasks easier because more of the genome is dedicated to genes, but it also makes some of the bioinformatic tasks harder. So, for example, one thing that's a real issue is that transcripts very often overlap. So you can imagine a scenario where three prime end of this genome, sorry, of this gene, overlaps with the three prime end of transcripts originating from, from this gene. And that means that when we're assembling RNA-seq data, for example, that, that can create some problems. Something else about these parasites is that they're intracellular. This is a malaria parasite here inside a red blood cell. And sorry. these parasites then live inside the vertebrate cells in the case of the red blood cell, there's no nucleus, but in other life stages such as the liver stages, its host cell actually has a nucleus and transcripts as well. And this creates some technical challenges for purifying messenger RNA from the parasite without getting too much contamination from, from human transcripts. 
But it also creates, I think, a very interesting biological phenomenon of, of one eukaryotic cell living inside another eukaryotic cell. So there have been a number of RNA-seq studies now of parasites from this phylum, uh, and in particular in the Plasmodium genus, there have been a number of RNA-seq surveys. Some of those reported around about 6% of genes in this species are subject to alternative splicing, and then smaller scale studies where people have looked at individual genes by RT-PCR have reported greater than 16% of those genes to be subject to alternative splicing. So we wanted to look at that in, in more detail in, in these parasites and to figure out whether or not this reported discrepancy of, say, 6% compared to 90% in humans, whether that, that's a real difference or whether that's potentially due to, to methodological differences. We got interested in alternative splicing in these parasites because of a couple of example genes that I want to take you through quickly. Here's one example here where the parasite makes two different proteins. The, the names of these proteins, it doesn't really matter what they are, uh, ALAD, which is a heme biosynthesis enzyme, and SPP, which is involved in protein processing. And both of these two proteins, the red one and the blue one, need to get into a compartment called the plastid. This is a relic chloroplast in these parasites. And so they use this targeting sequence, which is encoded by the two green exons here, and they alternatively splice those two exons onto the two different uh, other combinations of exons in order to be able to target both of these proteins into this compartment where they, they need to get to the plastid. The other case we're interested in in is also uh, relevant to the plastid. In, in this case here, we have one gene which is a cysteine tyranase synthetase. And tyranase synthetases are, are needed in all compartments where protein translation is active. And we need a cysteine tyranase synthetase in the plastid as well as in the, uh, as well as in the cytosol. And in this case here, there's only one protein encoded by the, the whole genome. And this protein needs to get into both of the compartments. And it does that by alternatively splicing transcripts from this locus so that you have one longer form which has a targeting sequence on it which directs the protein into the plastid. And when we localise this form here, we find that it localises exclusively to the plastid, whereas the other splice form here, which makes up more of the protein in the cell, directs proteins into the cytosol. So alternative splicing in this case gives rise to necessary diversity in, in targeting so that one protein can be directed to the, the two different compartments in which it's needed. So we were interested in what were the molecular uh, players that were involved in regulating this splicing. Some of this presumably occurs to some extent uh, constitutively, for lack of a, a better word, but there must be something that's regulating it so that it allows both of these splice forms to exist. Uh, so people in, in this institute uh, are responsible for the discovery of, of many of these molecules, molecules like U2A, F65, and we're interested in the uh, serine arginine proteins as well as the polypyrimidine tract binding proteins which potentially are regulating splicing in, in this parasite. So we went looking for those, we found PTBs, they turned out to be difficult to work on because in Plasmodium these proteins themselves or their transcripts themselves seem to be subject to alternative splicing and that created some difficulties in, in, in cloning the right genes. So we focused more on the SR proteins. And we created a phylogenetic tree of the SR proteins from Toxoplasma and from Plasmodium. Plasmodium in red, Toxoplasma in green. And we're comparing them to these sequences in black, which are the human SR proteins. And you can see here that there are, uh, how many, seven different SR protein or SR-like proteins from Plasmodium and one, two, three, four, five SR-like proteins from Toxoplasma. Some of them appear to match reasonably one-to-one -to, -one to, to human SR proteins, like maybe this cluster down here, and some of them appear to be very diverse uh, so that we wouldn't expect that they are, uh, are conserved exactly in their function. So we tried to uh, 
perturb the expression and characterize these proteins in both of these parasites, plasmodium and in toxoplasma. I'm going to talk first about some of the experiments in toxoplasma. So first we uh, created epitope tagged versions of these proteins. So in this case here, we are using an artificial promoter system where we are fusing the SR protein to a C-terminal HA tag and then localizing those in the parasites. And we see in these parasites that the SR proteins are almost entirely restricted to the nucleus and we see that we get proteins tagged of, of the size that we expect for the different SR proteins. Let me see if I can explain better what we're looking at here. In this case here, we can see a zoomed in region of a human cell. So around this region here is a human fibroblast and then there's a vacuole which contains four toxoplasma parasites inside that vacuole. And then in red we can see uh, a, a DNA stain and you can see that the SR proteins are co-localizing with that. If we blow those up, we can see that there's not uniform staining or uniform labeling throughout the nucleus, but a somewhat speckly pattern that maybe is consistent with the nuclear speckles that are often observed for SR proteins in, in mammalian systems. And they are probably foci in the nucleus of uh, either transcription factories or of, of splicing uh, foci. The next thing we wanted to do was to modulate these proteins. And we tried to knock out a number of these proteins or to knock down their expression. And we also tried to overexpress some of these proteins. There are dangers in overexpressing SR proteins that some of you will be familiar with. This is not necessarily the ideal way of studying, studying the function of SR proteins. If you have too much of an SR protein in a cell, potentially it's going to bind to, to off-target places. But this was the only system that we could get working really well, uh, at least at the time that we did this in, uh, in toxoplasma. So we're fusing, in this case here, an SR protein to an HA tag at its M-terminus, and then to a domain called a destabilization domain. So this is a, a system that allows tuning of stability of this protein. And that system is responsive to a molecule called shield. So in the absence of this small molecule shield, this protein would be degraded, but shield prevents this protein from self-degradation and stabilizes the protein. And that's a tunable system. So the more shield you add or the longer you add shield, the more protein you get expressed. And this construct here, just as the others I've described you, also goes to the nucleus and it's tagging the protein that we expect it to. And we can see that we can control the level of expression of this protein. In the absence of shield we get almost no expression. In the presence of shield we can get strong expression. And we can tune that so that when we add shield for longer or if we use more shield then we can drive higher levels of SR overexpression. And so we wanted to look at what this was doing first to parasite health. And we use an assay that's similar to one that you'd be familiar with, which is a plaque assay. So in this cartoon here, we've got many human uh, fibroblasts, and we infect those with toxoplasma parasites. And where they land, they create plaques where they've landed in a human cell, burst that human cell, infected the neighboring cells, and then created an area that's devoid now of, of live human cells. So these white patches here are areas where the parasite's grown quickly and managed to, to create a lytic environment around it. And so we can stain that, and this is an example of a real image of these plaques of, of lysed human cells where toxoplasma parasites have grown. And we can compare the size of those different plaques in different conditions to, as a surrogate for how well the parasite is growing. So in the absence of shield, we get very strong growth. In the presence of a small amount of shield, we get slightly smaller plaques. And in larger concentrations of shield, so higher expression of SR3, we get almost no growth of the parasite. So we wanted to take then the smallest amount of overexpression that we could measure and then detect what difference this was or what impact this was having on splicing in these parasites. So we took those parasites with different uh, incubation times and different levels of shield and subjected those to RNA-seq. So we're now purifying these toxoplasma parasites from their host cells 
In this case, we can do that reasonably well so we don't get too much human contamination. And then we are uh, purifying the mRNA and subjecting it to RNA-seq. We used Illumina sequencing in this case. And the idea here is that we're getting small Illumina RNA-seq reads. And when we assemble those, either de novo or by mapping them to the toxoplasma genome, we can see what's happening with the transcripts in this parasite. There are some limitations of this technique particularly because the reads using Illumina sequencing are very small, there are issues about how, how do you know whether or not a read at the five prime end of the gene that had an altered intron here was also found on the same transcripts that had an altered exon at the three prime end, for example. So it's hard to put together from these short read technologies what the actual long transcripts look like at the end, but you can at least see for individual junctions what the diversity of, of the splice uh, environment is like. As I said, you can do that in two different ways, by informatically, either by aligning them to the genome or by de novo assembly of those and then analysis of these uh, mapped transcripts. So we, uh, we performed that here. This is an example of of the mapping here, in the upper case we have a, uh, a non-treated parasite and in the lower case we have a treated parasite that's got more uh, SR protein being expressed. And you can see at this junction here that we've got a change in one of the splice boundaries here. So in the grey are reads and you can see that there's an intron between this region here and this region here. And that splice boundary, in some cases, is moving in, in these mutant parasites that are overexpressing the SR. So you could go through a whole genome and look at that manually. That would be obviously too laborious to do at a whole genome level. And so there are a number of bioinformatic packages out there that attempt to measure the differences in splicing or differences in alternative splicing between two different conditions. And we used a package called DexSeq that is, uh, in general, uh, designed for this type of application. And what it does is that it takes individual uh, bins of exons or different subregions within exons and it counts how many reads are mapping to them in the two different conditions. And then it can compare, is there a statistical difference in the abundance of, say, this sub-exonic bin in, in this condition compared to that condition there. And so we can then do a statistical analysis where we're saying, yes, in this condition here, this part of this exon is, is more abundant in, in A than in B. Or this exon appears to be being skipped in, in a bunch of, uh, of these parasites. So we found that changes in alternative splicing in these parasites were very widespread. And we went looking then uh, by using quantitative RT-PCR to verify some of the more interesting alternative splicing events. And we saw that uh, of... I'll go through this quickly. In blue here, this is an example that didn't change in our RNA-seq and it didn't change in our uh, RT-PCR. And then for the events where we did get changes in alternative splicing, we were able to confirm those by RT-PCR as well. So some of these are interesting genes in that they're known to have functional consequences of different splice variants. And we also went looking for novel proteins, proteins that weren't known to have alternative splicing and tried to investigate which of these might have interesting alternative splicing events. And I would say the numbers ex of examples we found were actually few and far between. Most of the splice events that we saw generated proteins that would now have a premature stop code on and a small number of them had say a skipped exon or a new piece of coding sequence or a skipped piece of coding sequence. And this is at one example here uh, GID A, a glucose inhibited division protein A. Its normal purpose is to modify the wobble position of tRNA. And we saw changes in alternative splicing in this protein here. You can see that on the DEC-seq uh, output uh, shown here. And so we've got in one of the alternatively spliced isoforms uh, a longer exon. And that longer exon creates a insertion in the middle of one of the protein domains here. And that's a protein domain that binds to NADH. And so this is crucial to the function of this protein. So an insertion within this domain 
presumably changes the capacity of this protein to bind NADH. We don't know what the consequences of this are, but this is, this is the type of event that we, that we see changed. So we haven't really gone through these one by one and tried to pursue what the exact functional change will be here. And, and I don't know whether that's a good use of our time. I think many of these cases will be simply errors or examples where the parasite is making a non-functional version of a protein. Um, but we will increasingly try to identify the most interesting of these examples. So from the toxoplasma work, we found that alternative splicing, even in the absence of perturbations of these SR proteins, was very widespread. At least 2,000 of the genes in this genome appear to be subject to alternative splicing. But the meaning of those alternatively spliced uh, transcripts is not always clear. Many of them appear to introduce premature stop codons, and so they're either, they're either errors or they're ways that the parasite is able to quickly modulate uh, stability of a transcript. And we also see then profound changes in the alternative splicing when we overexpress this SR protein, which suggests that SR is responsible for the regulation of some of these alternative splice events. As I said before, there's some caveat here in that we are overexpressing an SR protein, and that's a slightly dangerous way to, to interrogate the function of SR proteins. I wanted to talk a little bit more on this question that I raised earlier about the importance of alternative splicing for differentiation between different cell types. And people have studied in much detail the importance of alternative splicing for example, in differences between di human tissues. So if you look at brain tissue or liver tissue or muscle tissue, you'll see different change or different alternative splice events in these different tissues. And it appears that some of that alternative splicing is actually crucial to the differentiation between these tissues. So we don't have different tissues in plasmodium, but we wondered whether or not these different life stages here were in some way analogous to the different tissue changes that you see in multicellular eukaryotes. So we wondered whether or not, for example, changes between the liver stage and the blood stage and the mosquito stages might be equivalent to the changes that you see between human brain and liver and muscle tissue. This is a, uh, a blown up picture now of the plasmodium life cycle where you get uh, these liver stages, a proliferative blood stage, uh, sexual forms being made, taken up by a mosquito during a blood meal, and then these haploids fusing to form a, uh, a diploid, undergoing meiosis to form these uh, sporozoites which infect the salivary gland and can then be passed in the saliva to, to a, a new person. And to study this, we used this species Plasmodium bergii, which we can use to infect rodents. The other nice thing about Plasmodium bergii is it has quite a well-developed genetic system. And so people at the Sanger Institute in the UK have developed a library of vectors that allows uh, modification of many of these proteins. And that's called the Plasmogem system. And so they very kindly provided us with many of these plasmids. And we used these to try and tag and to knock out many of the Plasmodium bergii SR proteins. And then we collaborated with... Uh, my colleague at the University of Melbourne, Jeff McFadden, who allowed us, or collaborated with us, to analyse these parasites in different mosquito stages and different uh, vertebrate stages. And this work was also um, performed by Vanessa Mollard in Jeff's lab, as well as Dean Goodman and, and Ton Kajansen. You can also see in this photo the, the proximity of Melbourne to excellent surf beaches. So please come and visit and have a surf sometime. So this is an example of, of one of the types of change that we made here where we're knocking in an HA uh, tag into the genome so that we're able to localise these proteins. As in toxoplasma, these proteins are localised almost exclusively to the, the nucleus, although we expect that there must be shuttling of these proteins from the nucleus back and forth between the cytoplasm. The next thing that we did was to try and knock out these proteins. So these are, uh, uh, these are now parasites that have the gene completely deleted. Um, I'm going to take you through one of the examples 
a knockout of this SR4 protein. So we conduct these experiments first, or we create the knockouts in this blood stage. So this is mouse blood in this case here. And we knocked out the SR4, and we knocked out some of the other proteins as well. So in the case of some of the others, we couldn't recover the parasite. So they're probably essential in these stages here. But SR4 appeared to have no defect in these blood stages here. So the parasites could proliferate within the blood, and they seemed to grow just as fast as the wild type. And to confirm that, we did what are called competition assays. So we're competing wild-type parasites against the knockout parasites and looking to see whether one outcompetes or outgrows the other in the blood. And we see no changes in this. And when we, uh, we tag these with different uh, fluorescent proteins to be able to measure these, and we see no difference in, in the growth rates of these different parasites. So at least in the blood stages, there seems to be no defect. This SR4 protein doesn't seem to be responsible for at least any defect in, in this stage just here. We can induce these parasites to create these sexual forms called gametocytes, and I'm not going to show you the data for that, but these gametocytes appear to be created at the same rate in these mutant parasites. And when we uh, drop the temperature and change the pH, they also create these gamete forms, and that happens naturally when the mosquito takes a blood meal. The mosquito is colder than the mammalian blood, and the temperature changes, and there are other accompanying chemical changes. And that induces these gametocytes to form these gametes, which are going to have sex within the um, mosquito's midgut. So we could see female gametes being formed normally, and we couldn't see these forms here being formed normally, which are male gametes. So these are a form which is kind of analogous to human sperm. It's the male, highly motile, and very small stage here. And if you take parasites in the blood and allow them to cool, they'll naturally start making these exflagellating male gametes. So you can see that they're very highly active, these very sort of whip-like forms, and these were the forms that were spotted early on in plasmodium uh, research in the 19th century where people took blood from malaria patients and were able to see these very highly motile forms. So in our case here, our wild type parasites do this normally and they create these really beautiful um, male gametes which are uh, highly motile, but the knockout parasites don't make these male gametes. So there seems to be a stage and sex-specific defect in these knockout parasites. They can make me females normally, but they can't make the, the male gametes normally. We can quantitate that, and in many experiments we see no males made at all, and in some of the experiments we do see a very small number of these male gametes being made in the knockout parasites. And this actually matches a study that was conducted several years ago in uh, Sanger, where uh, Oliver Bilker's group shot, looked at a bunch of different kinases that they tried to knock out in different stages, and they found that one of the kinases, an SR protein kinase, had a similar defect that also was able to make gametocytes but wasn't able to exflagellate. So it's possible that this kinase which is knocked out may be the kinase that's governing the action of the, of the SR protein that we're studying here. So we've showed that there's no defect in the blood stage there is a specific defect in the male gamete stage, and we tried to characterise now the rest of this life cycle. So we can make these form oocysts, and we can image the oocysts, which in a very bad infection, cover the whole outside surface of the female mosquito's stomach. And we can stain those, and they look like this. So these are individual cysts on the surface of the, the female's stomach, each filled with many malaria parasites. And we can count those and quantitate those in the uh, wild type compared to the knockout parasites. And in this case, we see a considerable reduction in the number of oocysts in this SR knockout compared to the wild type parasite. And some of that must be coming from the reduction in the gametes that are going on to form these oocyst parasites. We've worked on that in some detail, but I'm not going to go through that today, trying to figure out how much of this defect is a, a carryover from, from the earlier defect. But in any case, the parasites are able to make normal and healthy oocysts. And then we look at whether or not they're able to make sporozoites, and they seem to be able to do that fine. 
And when we take these mosquitoes and allow them to bite mice, we then look not so much at whether or not the parasites are able to establish a liver infection, because these are very small in number, but we look at the time taken till the parasite actually is present in the blood again. And when we look at the wild type compared to the knockout, we see that there's no difference in the time to patency, the time to when we can detect parasites in the blood again. So the rest of this life cycle stages here don't seem to be affected by this, this SR knockout. So it seems really to be quite a specific defect, as I said before, that's a stage-specific and gender-specific or sex-specific defect. So this really looks like this SR protein is particularly needed for one particular stage transition from, from the vertebrate stage to the invertebrate stage and only in one of the genders. So what we wanted to do next was to look at the transcriptional events that underlie this defect here. And to do that, we took parasites from the asexual stages and we also took parasites from these stages here, which in the case of the females are able to normally transition, but the males, which are not able now to make these male gametes. The male gametes. And we were able to do that by putting different fluorescent protein reporters in these different parasites and fax sort them out. And after many hours of fax sorting, we could get enough parasites that we could then do RNA-seq on those parasites. So again, we're going back to this Illumina sequencing to try and look at the splicing events that are happening in the, the wild type compared to the knockout parasites. And again, we're using DexSeq to analyse the splicing events. Um, and we only got that uh, data in the last couple of weeks, so we haven't finished analysing it. Unfortunately, this field is an area where the bioinformatic tools available are still, I think, a little bit underdeveloped in being able to answer all of the questions that we have. And we're also maybe not sophisticated enough in the sorts of questions that we're asking. But looking at a, at a rough level, we see that alternative splicing is particularly perturbed in our male gametocytes. So the asexual forms, their alternative splicing is not changed much at all. The females do have some alternative splicing events that are changed, but the males have many, up to 20% of their alternative splicing is changed in these mutant parasites. So it seems quite likely that the SR protein is giving rise to changes in alternative splicing, and when you knock that out, these defects in alternative splicing are making the parasite now unable to make the male gametes that would be necessary to infect the mosquito. So we think that this is somewhat uh, on the way to proving this hypothesis that alternative splicing in these parasites is in fact analogous to stage differentiation or tissue differentiation in, in mammalian systems such that we get a stage and, and gender specific defect here. In summary, we've shown that what alternative splicing is actually more widespread than was anticipated in these parasites, but we still have this problem of trying to understand how much of the alternative splicing is giving rise to a more device proteome and how much of it is giving rise to non-functional transcripts or transcripts that can be silenced so that this mechanism might be more to do with... Uh, gene abundance rather than proteome diversity. We've shown that, diff also, that regulation of alternative splicing is essential in these parasites and that it's specifically regulated by the SR proteins as it is in other systems. Uh, I've said this already, it, it may be that this serves to maximise proteome diversity using a very compact genome, but it also could be that it's m more about transcript stability. And I think we've gone some way to showing that, as I said before, this analogy of uh, human tissue differences are similar to these unicellular protist stages differentiating between uh, their different life stages. So I want to thank the people involved in this work, Lee Yo in particular in my lab, also Dean, Vanessa and Ton in Jeff McFadden's lab. The PlasmoGem team very kindly provided reagents that we used for molecular uh, perturbation of the SRs in Plasmodium burgii. Nathan Hall is a bioinformatician who helped us with some of the analysis. 
Drew Berry made one of the animations that I used it from WeHi, and thanks to funding from the University of Melbourne, Australian Society of Parasitology, and the Australian governments, NHMRC and ARC, as well as the VLSCI. Thanks very much.